Oh yeah, I like snakes. Redo that. I like turtles meme, but with Ben. <laughs> Instead of a little kid that's like overly energetic, it's a very tired 40 year old. From ScienceSortOf.com, you're listening to Science Sort Of. Welcome to Science Sort Of. You're listening to episode 345. Our theme this week is Evil Prevails. And joining me to talk about things that are science, things that are sort of science, and things that wish they were science, it's the man himself in the possibly android flesh. It's Ben Tippett. Hello. How Dr. Is ben Tippett. Yes, that's me, Dr. Ben Tippett. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you again. I yeah. can see you, by the way. Well, I mean, they can see you too, Ben, because they are viewers. Oh, yes. How's your life, sir? I got a puppy. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. What happened? He he looks well. Uh, The short answer is I talked to my wife, who is a cat person, Mm. uh, a very, a very militant cat person. I talked her into getting a puppy, just like the dog that visited her once as a child, a dog I came out say, of the I night. Say in a dream. <laughs> no, well, we named the dog in a dream. But yeah, when she was a child, a puppy showed up on on their like parents' property, and it was evening. And so their dad said, "Well, this we we better let it in the house because you know." And the next morning, the dog went and waited at the end of the driveway until its owners drove past and then picked it up. And so I was like, "What if we get this type of puppy?" because there is somebody nearby who breeds them and is about to stop breeding them. So your time is almost up. And there you so, go. So she's I, like, yeah. um, I've seen some photos of said puppy yes. and it is absolutely adorable. Yes. Um, what flavor of puppy? He is a Finnish Spitz type dog, which wow. means that he looks like a fox and he acts like a fox and he bites like a fox, I guess. How, how big is he gonna get? How old is he now? How big is he gonna get? He he's he's three months old now. He's gonna get about thirty pounds, about knee height, I think. Okay. Yeah, I didn't want to. Well, the the local shelters around here actually, everybody says you should adopt a pet, and I generally agree. But the local shelters here only briefly ever have dogs because everybody in our my particular area just loves having dogs and they love oh, wow. having huge dogs. And so there's never like medium or small sized dogs around here. It's always just like these enormous like cow herding dogs that people can ride around on and take on long mountain hikes. And, uh, you know, St. Bernard. So this, like, looking, looking, now that I know what breed your dog, because, you know, all puppies kind of look roughly puppy shaped. And so I'm yes. looking at, did you say his name or are we keeping that secret? No, I, I'll tell you his name so that somebody can drive up and steal my dog. Yeah. No, definitely. don't. Let's not going to say it. Oh, um, you're not? Okay. You know, I, I, I wouldn't risk it for a okay. dog that cute. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't come when I call him by his name. So I don't see why somebody who opens the door to their car and calls him would get any better response <laughs> clementine for reference is about 42 43 pounds yes Mulder will be about two-thirds the weight of clementine because he's a fox is that why yeah because he's a fox looking at some adult versions of this breed of dog helps shore up my theory that finland is the japan of scandinavia <laughs> i hear Right? Because this is a Scandinavian Shiba Inu, if I've, yeah. if I've ever seen one. Yes, definitely. Uh, those this are both is a Shiba ancient Inu dogs, finish. as I understand it. Yeah. And they're both very selfish. <laughs> oh. I think they're very, they're, you know, I'm in a, in a puppy training class, and the other dogs in the puppy training classes are all sorts of ages. You know, they're all puppies. But so Mulder is one of the younger ones. And I can say that that's part of it. But there's a dog who's a week and a half younger than Mulder who learns every trick immediately. And that's a Border Collie dog. So Mulder is quite smart. I'm not sure if he's less smart than the Border Collie dog. I think it's that he he cares less what I think than the Border Collie dog. Border Collies just always need to be like solving a puzzle. If yeah. Not solving, if, if border collies aren't so- solving a puzzle, they're destroying your house. They need they need to be solving a puzzle or making their humans happy. And this one, it's it. She really wants to make their human happy, which is great. Well, you, know, you know who else has a dog? 
does Noam Chomsky have a dog? Well, Noam Chomsky is the dog of the friend of which I am referring to. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Our mutual friend, uh, to the north, but also happens to be named Ryan North, is an author of some renown, I would say. Yeah, he is He is well known. I've had friends who come over to my house for the first time and see his works on my bookshelf and then tell me how much they love him. So, yeah. And then do you immediately go take out Squirrel Girl and be like, well, I, he loves me because he put me in this thing? I do. Honestly, you should. Yeah, you should. I do. I've got, I've got the copies here. And yeah, no, I brag about it. I have impressed cousins whose job it is to not be impressed by all the, all the tricks I can do. Yeah, I've impressed, well, I've impressed very difficult people to impress by being in Squirrel Girl. Even though we are friends of his, and even though we are both affiliated with comic books in one way or another, me with, you know, like the iFanboy stuff I do, you with, like, by existing in the Marvel Universe, I don't know that we made it into his most recent book, but we are adjacent to it in that Ryan North stopped by the show to talk about his latest book, How to Take Over the World, Practical Schemes and Scientific Solutions for the Aspiring Supervillain. And uh, we already recorded that conversation in which evil will prevail. And so why don't we just, uh, why don't we kick it over to Ryan? Yeah, it's a good interview. is a New York Times bestselling author whose books include How to Invent Everything, Romeo and or Juliet, and To Be or Not to Be. He's the creator of Dinosaur Comics and the Eisner Award winning writer of Adventure Time, Jughead and the Unbeatable Squirrel Girl for Marvel Comics. And he has a master's in computational linguistics from the University of Toronto. Ryan lives in Toronto with his wife, Jen, and their dog, Noam Chomsky. Ryan's also been on the show before, we think at least twice, but we know for certain episode 44, which we call Dinosaur Language. And also, if your names happen to be Kelly and Zach, you may know him as Manly Ryan due to an overabundance of Ryans in your life, of which I happen to be a part of that problem. He's here today <laughs> to talk to us about his new book, How to Take Over the World, Practical Schemes and Scientific Solutions for the Aspiring Supervillain. Welcome back to the show, Ryan. Thank you for having me. I'm glad I get to be Manly Ryan. That's exciting. You are Manly Ryan. Yeah, that, the, the, you, that was what I was told when Zach was explaining to me his Ryan-based naming schema. <laughs> what's, what's your name? See, I don't want to say that because embar- they call me Handsome Ryan, which is embarrassing. So, I don't oh. <laughs> but I think, well, great, I listen, think it's, it's been great to be on the show. I got to go. I got to make some calls. <laughs> I think, I think what, happened, what, what happened is you know, they, they, we knew each other from doing the podcast and then they met me and I'm not like an ogre. And so I think that was like enough of a like surprise that they were like, oh, like he's actually a decent looking person. We, <laughs> they assume anyone in radio has like a, a bad face. Right. And and you had already taken Manly Ryan, Ryan. And so I, that was unavailable to me. So they had to come up with something else. So I mean, this is Manly Ryan and Handsome Ryan and Ben. Yeah. And <laughs> that's beautiful right. Ben. <laughs> so Ryan, before we dive in too much, since this wasn't in the list of, of books that your publisher sent to us, my wife, Julie, wanted me to make sure that I told you how much she enjoyed the Machine of Death anthology series, um, oh, nice. and which is not a question, but it was just something she wanted to make sure I mentioned. That's super great. Thank you. Yeah, that was that was a great book to put together. Book, great series of books to put together. Yeah, I could I could definitely see I could see a way to do a story in that anthology series that involves a lot of these super villainy antics that you've been writing about more recently. So I guess to talk about the new book a little bit, you explain this in the text of the book itself, but can you elaborate a bit on how you became sort of the self-described authority on super villainy based on your personal <laughs> combo of science and comic book writing? Yeah, the the sort of premise of the book is that I have been writing, and this is true, a lot of comics from Marvel and DC, and when you're writing a superhero comic, one of the demands of the genre is that the superhero always wins. But it's a more exciting comic. It's a more interesting comic. It's a more thrilling comic if 
say hero wins at the last possible second, which means there has to be some flaw in the villain's scheme that they can exploit. And it doesn't uh, take much when you're thinking that way to say, well, what if the villain didn't have to lose? And the other wrinkle is that comics are more exciting if they're credible. And so without kind of realizing it, these giant multinational entertainment conglomerates like Disney and uh, AT&T Time Warner, who own DC, have been paying me and people like me to come up with these increasingly credible world domination schemes, and they're failing only because we're making them fail. And so that's that's sort of the, the fun wrapper on it. But the, the real meat of the book is let's explore the edges and these interesting parts of science and technology through this lens, because I find it's really interesting when you have a reason to care, right? And if I'm trying to talk about, if I'm trying to figure out like how many calories can a square meter of farmland support, that's not very interesting until I say, I'm trying to figure out the size of my secret base so I can support hench people. And then you're like, oh, I do care about that. Mm. Yes, let's figure out this farming stuff. So for me, it's it's a fun way to uh, approach the actual science and technology and history and politics and, and world that we live in through this lens of, you know what? Let's take a supervillain's point of view and explore how credible these classic supervillain schemes are. We don't we don't have shrink rays, we don't have mind control helmets, but we do have actual materials. And so can we, you know, dig a hole to the Earth's core or de-extinct dinosaurs and what is the actual science behind immortality and how how long can we ensure that we're remembered? And how far into the future can we communicate? And some really interesting stuff comes out of that. So that is a, a long answer to tell us about your book. But I'm, I'm excited about it. So that's no, no, that's about. great. Yeah, I love the whole like how do we how do we make sure that we're known in the future? Question. I read an excellent book that we didn't cover on the show because I wrote a review for it for Science Magazine called Underland by mm-hmm. Robert McFarlane, and he has an entire chapter about like how do we bury nuclear waste and then label it in such a way that people in the future don't think that it's valuable. Yeah. And it like, sounds like an, an easy problem. And they're like, wait, no, this is actually really, really hard because we right. can't rely on language. And then the, 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 the paradox you have is any sort of warning label is inherently interesting because <laughs> it's, yep, yep. it's, it's there when nothing else is. And so the challenges of long-term nuclear waste storage, uh, one of the things that I use in my book for trying to talk to the future I said the difference there is that we're trying to be remembered. So it's a benefit that we are inherently interesting because we're not trying to keep people away from nuclear waste and stop them from building jewelry out of it and then dying in 10 years. <laughs> it's also it's crazy to think about how like this is a problem that the pharaohs had to contend with because like they also wanted to bury a bunch of valuable stuff with them and keep people away. So they just like said, it's cursed. Don't go in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's been a problem that humans have dealt with for a long time. I, I don't want to go any further to discussing the book without mentioning the fact that it is illustrated by Carly Minardo. Hopefully I'm mm-hmm. saying her, her name correctly. You are. You nail it. And she just adds a fantastic dimension to this book and that you sort of explicitly call out other authors for not having the courage to have illustrations. (laughs) And I was just really curious to, if you could tell us how that collaboration got going and what it's like working with an illustrator on a project like this. Like, do you identify sections where you say, I would love an illustration here, or do you just give her the manuscript and let her have fun with it? And like, is it, is it similar to scripting a comic in that sense? Or is it kind of a a different animal entirely? A little bit. So when I was writing the book, I would, say I'd like an illustration here and I'd I'd sketch out like here's what the illustration could be and then I talked to Carly and she was game for it and so we'd have these calls where I would describe the chapter because I'm not going to hire someone to illustrate a book and then be like you have to read every single word (laughs) so I I told her what the illustration would be and what the context was and then we would collaborate and she would basically every time find a way to punch up what I had imagined and it was her idea to have this supervillain character throughout the illustrations throughout the book. So you sort of follow this, this supervillain on her journey, trying to accomplish these schemes as you're also learning about uh, how these schemes could and would work. And so it was, it was great. Like it's, it's always one of the greatest things about writing comics is that you imagine a story and you write a script and then you get back these pencils from an artist who have drawn something that is always better than you imagined. <laughs> And it's, it's such a thrill. So getting to see these illustrations that were both better than I imagined when I imagined them and also funnier because she was she was punching them up and coming with better ideas. What I had said really elevated the book. They're just they were just great calls, too, because Carly and I are, are great friends. And so it's like a hangout call where also we produced a nice <laughs> part of a book out of it, too. 
I've, I've got a question. Shoot. So the format of this book is really fun. By the way, as listeners, every every chapter has like a theme. How do I, as a super villain, tackle a particular problem? And at the end of it, it gives a uh, a cute executive summary with like it tells you how much money you'll get back and how long it takes to, for the plan to come to fruition. It's great. But the question is another one about format. You have, mm-hmm. I mean, I have read a lot of your books. Thank you. And comic books. You kind of make a habit of putting jokes into the footnotes as you work. (laughs) And I'm wondering if this is kind of becoming a novel literary form because there's important content in the footnotes. Like usually you expect the footnotes, you can kind of gloss over them in a a random book. But in Mm -hmm. a, in a, in Ryan North book, you have to read the footnotes as you go because that's where the, that's where the tasty spicy bits are. Is this, (laughs) is this, have you revolutionized book writing? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I like you these got- hardball questions. Are you as brilliant as you seem? <laughs> no, but I'll give you the, the sincere answer is, and this is not a fully thought of thing, but something I've been thinking about as I've been writing is that we have gone from people who usually would consume, read one book at a time or a couple books in parallel, but one book a night sort of thing to now I'm looking at my computer screen and I have easily 40 tabs open. And I like the idea of writing a book sort of in a more internet-y way where when you do have an interesting aside, the footnote is almost like clicking that link in Wikipedia to mm-hmm. be like, oh, what? tell me more about that. And so they do retain this echo of their structure where they are technically optional. You can just read the book and you'll get a complete book out of it. But there's so much cool stuff in the world. And <laughs> I'd, li- I'd like to include it. I'd like to be like, yeah, there's some really interesting things that to, to explore here. I will say the first draft of the book I sent to my editor, there were 365, I think, footnotes in it. And she said, Ryan, there are, these are, this is too many footnotes. Like, I know you like footnotes, but you need to have a book too, and not just a collection of footnotes. And so I cut it down to, I think, 150. And that was by moving some stuff up into the main text or by deciding we didn't really need this footnote. This was actually too tangential. <laughs> so that, that's my short history and theory of footnotes in the modern era. But I mean, it's 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 interesting to me that you do it like this, and that this is the the reason you do it because it's 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 kind of delightful. It's like you're you're listening to a lecture where the person g- gives you a little aside and tells you some sassy things on the side. But it's also like it's delightfully nonlinear. But you can also imagine like you can't cut them out. But you also can't imagine like sewing them back into the text so it's like one mm-hmm. long document. The footnotes themselves are like foundational to how the information is being portrayed in the book. I don't know. Maybe maybe me me, me fanboying you is uh, boring everybody. No, but I mean there no, is no. like there is even a... that was all I wanted. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> there there is even a moment in the footnotes where you are explicit in like to prevent you from putting down this book and just looking up everything I just told you. I'm just going to explain it here. And I was like, well, that's hilarious. Like that's great. And, and it was what was you had listed like three different phenomena and like two of them I knew and the third one I didn't. And I legitimately was about to pull up my phone and look it up. But then mm-hmm. you, you, you prevented that. You were controlling the reader's eye very well, which I think, you know, is something a comic book person gets adept at when you're scripting a comic book because you have to think about the way a person's eye moves around the page. Yeah, it's funny because this is working in prose and people in publishing don't think of it that way. In comics, the page is your fundamental unit of story and you're aware of where everything is in the page because you can control it. You can control it. You can have like a turn the page reveal where a big thing happens, a big exciting moment. You want that to happen on an even numbered page because that's when you'll see when you turn the page and won't be spoiled by looking over to the facing page. But you don't have that in prose. And there's a bit in the book where uh, I have a scheme that goes poorly and the book says, you know, sorry, there's nothing else we can do. And then you turn the page and it says, for that plan, but every villain has a plan B and here's our plan yeah, B. Yeah, that was cute. That was, great, that was a good like, moment. <laughs> thank you. It took a lot of work to make sure that was working in the book because people weren't used to thinking of, of the page as the object and they're thinking of the paragraph. And I was like, no, we have to have a turn the page real. Otherwise, nothing works here. Think of it like a comic book. But yeah, the, the, the footnotes are the same thing where I, I want... When you're reading a book, you're inviting an author into your head. and I want it to be fun. And I also want it to be 
the best book it can be. And in that example you mentioned, it was the idea of like, yeah, if you don't remember this, let me just put it here. So you won't have to pick up a phone because we're in this together and I want you to enjoy your time reading the book. And I can make a joke about it be like, don't stop reading this book. Here's what you need. Now back to the book. And I think, you know, you're you're put, pointing out a kind of interesting distinction between prose and comic books or graphic novels. And, you know, Ben and I have read a ton of graphic novels and comics, and I do the iFanboy podcast pretty regularly. So, like, I, I a person who talks about comics publicly mm-hmm. and tries to think about them critically and, like, what makes them work and what makes them not work. And, you know, you, you talk about the, the page being the fundamental unit of storytelling, and you want your big reveals to happen on an even page number, which means that it's going to be on the left-hand side of the the binding because that's the when you turn the page that's the one you see mm-hmm. and i think within that the page being the fundamental unit the panel is sort of represents the paragraph but panels unless you're doing some really innovative comic book storytelling like a jh williams the third style page structure the panel is kind of a discrete unit in the same way that a paragraph is mm-hmm. a discrete unit but paragraphs tend to be more continuous with the paragraph that came before and the paragraph that came after in ways that I think panels are a little more discreet. And I think that you're, you were maybe playing with that a little bit in the way you structured that page turn in a prose, you know, style, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely, that's hundred percent correct. Correct. And I was just trying to capture that feel you have in comics of turning the page and being surprised. And that's really, you don't see that in prose that often because no one's thinking of how the the words land on the page. They'll change between editions. They'll change between large print and small print. Like it's it's so fluid. But when you lock it down and make sure it works, you can capture that same emotional experience of feeling like you've lost, turning the page and seeing that you've won, <laughs> or the hero has won. And right. that's that's and what I wanted. That comics feeling in prose. The the only time I think I've had a similar reaction to a page turn in a book was Neil Stevenson's Seven Eves. But there's a moment in that book, if you've read it, you know exactly the moment I'm talking about. I don't want to spoil it, so I'm not going to say anything more than that. But it, it's also separating two sections of the book. So it's not like it's not the same thing, really, but it's the only other time I, I remember kind of gasping on a page turn mm-hmm. in a prose book. So not really a question. I just love seven names. I want to talk about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I thought about as I was reading this book, and I think you did this on purpose, but I would love to talk a little bit more about it is sort of a lot of the schemes you present in the book aren't exactly what I would call evil. They're only villainous because, and you'd explain this well in the book, you're breaking some sort of law or norm or disrupting life as we know it in some way. But maybe you thought you probably thought about this in ways that I haven't. Is there some distinction between being villainous and being evil that I'm failing to see based on the the way you present things in the book? Yeah. And you're right. That was, that was fully intentional. Um, The main thing being is that I felt like there's a big difference between real world crime, which is for example, robbing a bank and super crime, which is for example, stealing a bank. (laughs) (laughs) super crime like you're in this realm of fun and impossibility where it seems like it should be impossible but if we can find a way to do it that's inherently interesting and i felt like if i was in the real world the mundane world of of guns and crime and like lives ruined by people behaving poorly to each other that's a, not fun, B, depressing, and C, very serious. But if we keep in the world of hypothetical, unprecedented supercrime, then it's fun and it's charismatic and we can think about it and laugh and it's not going to be a distraction. And so, I mean, yes, the book is called How to Take Over the World and yes, the plots are, are classic supervillain plots, but the goal is not to harm people <laughs> or to you know, make someone suffer so you can gain in some sort of zero sum view of the world. The goal is to do impossible things and not ask for permission first. And I I sort of talk about, you know, you look at villains and heroes and there's a whole, we're not so different, you and I, classic conversation. And you look at like Thanos famously killed half the universe, but his goal was, I want a sustainable world (laughs) for my children, which is pretty relatable and pretty heroic. It's the way they go about it that's wrong. But instead, yeah, exactly. So, but he didn't. Instead yeah. of putting together a think tank to to come up with some other solutions, he just picked a solution he liked and then <laughs> pursued it at all costs. Yeah. yeah. So I like the and towards the end of the book, like when we're talking about not being forgotten, you start with this very villainous and selfish. I want to make sure people know my name forever. But as we look at ensuring that happens for one year, ten year, a hundred years, a thousand years, until we're getting out to the heat death of the universe, the question 
starts to become more cosmic of what what is communication? How can we communicate anything with someone we have no assumptions about and don't know what they look like or who they are? And can anything survive from from our planet? And what is most likely to survive to be the last thing in the universe that remains of planet Earth? And you get start with a super selfish, <laughs> I don't, I want to be remembered, and end up with this this cosmic tier of like, what does it mean to be alive and have an effect on the universe? And I love that you can go on that journey, starting with villainy and ending with like cosmic 70s space awareness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is classic Marvel comics. I mean, that's, yes, you know, yeah. you're, you're basically the silver surfer at that point. Or yeah, <laughs> Captain or whatever the villainous Marvel. version of the silver surfer is. Well, yeah, and I so, mean, yeah. Silver surfer started as a villain. He was working for Galactus, the destroyer of yeah. worlds. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, it's it's. I didn't want it to feel depressing, and I didn't want you to feel like you're on the wrong side. So we we stick to the super crimes of, of stealing banks, and it becomes, I think, a fun book because of that. Well, and it's funny that Charlie on this podcast has actually made the point about the Voyager spacecraft being, you know, possibly the only evidence that humanity ever existed in the far future. Once you know mm-hmm. the Earth, the plate tectonics have completely engulfed any evidence of human civilization. And so I guess what you need to do is you need to figure out that time travel thing. So you can go back and get yourself on the golden disc. <laughs> and that's the way to do I, it. Yeah. I, I want to mention that because people have like chapter six, I think is the book chapter in time travel. And it basically just says, look, I've tried, I can't figure it out, but if I do, I'm going to go back in time and change this manuscript. So everyone's books will be updated. So check this chapter periodically. And it's like a fun little joke, but also like, it's also a promise. It's sincere. And I like that I've committed to that. It makes me feel like I, I, I think it's structure great. in my it's- life. It reminds me of, you know, the 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 time I, this may be apocryphal, but the time Stephen Hawking threw a party but didn't send out the invitation until after the party occurred and so it was like you had to have t- backwards time travel to attend the party. Yeah. Yeah, it's in terms of my own personal experience, I really like that <laughs> chapter. So, you know, I do research on time travel occasionally and I've kind of made myself notorious for that and people take You know, I was always like, oh, if I talk about time travel, that'll be an opportunity to teach people about some cool physics. And, you know, people don't listen to you talk about time travel for physics. They listen to you talk about time travel so they can find out how to send you their life savings (laughs) because they really want to see their father again. And it's like, it's heartbreaking. So when I read this, I was like, time travel. Oh God, Ryan. Oh God. And I opened it and said, can't do it. And I was like, yes, that's the correct answer. (laughs) That's the thing you have to tell everybody so that they don't give some random person all of their life savings. It is horrible. I had to some experience not with time travel, but I, uh, early days of the internet, I emailed everyone I could find named Ryan North. And I said, I am the real Ryan North. You have to pay me thirty dollars. <laughs> pay me thirty dollars to use my name, just as a joke. I had a time in the computer lab at university. And you and hours. you wonder why you're the manly Ryan. That's such a power <laughs> move. Well, one of them, one of the guys wrote me back. A bunch of them wrote me back, but one guy in particular wrote me back. He's like, "Hey, uh, you know, you're clearly a child. You were eighteen or whatever." I'm forty two, so I am the future Ryan North. So if you have any questions for the future you hit me up and I'll answer. And I was like, oh, cool. This guy's playing along. So I was like, hey, future me, what advice do you have? And his response didn't get super serious. He's like, stay away from women named Susan. They'll ruin your life. And I was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't know if he had just gotten divorced or like something was going on. But we went from like a jokey time travel conversation to him, like detailing the problems he had with his marriage. And I didn't write back because this was not the conversation I wanted to have. And it was, it was, I mean, here I am talking about it 30 years later. It was such a while. <laughs> well, the, uh, you, you mentioned that the future Ryan North was 42, which reminds me of, you know, Douglas Adams, of course. And that the whole time travel joke, he also had like a version of that where he had that it, there's an in-universe book that's like time travel grammar and syntax. And mm-hmm. like the joke in Hitchhiker's Guide is that the book itself is so confusing that nobody's ever actually been able to finish reading it. So the printer eventually just stopped printing like the second half of the book. And it's just blank pages. <laughs> <laughs> I funny. really appreciate how alternate universe future Ryan North kept his younger self from making the same mistake. Good work, yeah, you know, Ryan. Never dated anyone named Susan. I never had the opportunity, but <laughs> that's right here in Ohio that your wife's name is Jen. That's not Susan. That's... <laughs> it's like the Ron Swanson Tammy thing. He butterfly uh, yeah. effect his way out of a divorce. 
Yeah, well, I okay. track in that email and I email it now and it bounces and I go, oh my God, he doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so so th- to accidentally emailing your future self seems like a pretty great villain origin story. But I feel like you, Ryan North, have had an actual credible supervillain origin story experience. And so I just want to say, is is being stuck in a pool a good way to create a supervillain? <laughs> I was wondering, like, which of my many adventures is he referring to there? <laughs> But yes, I got I got stuck in a in a hole, a, a skate bowl with my dog Chomsky. But I feel like that was that was less of a villain origin and more of just like almost a hero origin for the rest of the internet. Because yeah, what happened was people on Twitter were sending me suggestions of how to get out. Ben, you sent me one. I, and, I did too. I chimed, I chimed in at one point. Oh yeah, yeah, great. So you guys helped me get out, and eventually the the solution was hit upon where I combined items in my inventory to escape with Chomsky. And I spent an hour stuck in this hole, and I got home, and I thought, you know, that was a fun time on Twitter. And then... And you, you um, went into the hole because you thought it would be a nice place to take a picture of Chomsky, right? Yeah, it would be a cool picture of my dog. And yeah. then I get Which home from totally, this... Which is totally worth it. Absolutely reasonable. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, reason absolutely. Climb into a hole. And then I get home, and there's an uh, article in The Guardian about Canadian cartoonists stuck in a hole. And I was like, oh, it's international news. I see what's happening here. <laughs> And then uh, the Guardian ran a stock photo of a very shallow, like splash pad, not a skate pool. And so all of these hole experts in the comments were like, "I would simply take two steps to the right." And what is what is wrong with this guy? <laughs> and you're also like, you're a pretty tall guy. You're, t- I mean, you're taller than two I meters. Yeah. Both Ben and I, yeah, combined, um, yeah. And Ben and I, yeah. well, not combined. That's, that's <laughs> ben and I are conducting this interview in a very long trench coat, and I'm on Ben's shoulders. That's right. Um, <laughs> he keeps kicking me. My, I think that that incident, I remember following in real time. My wife and I had had a lot of fun laughing at your misfortune. And, <laughs> and, and I think it generated one of the greatest tweets in the history of Twitter, which was somebody was commenting on the situation and said, where were you when Ryan North got stuck in a hole? And you tweeted back, I was stuck in a hole. <laughs> <laughs> and I just love that so much. Good times in the hole. Yeah. Well, we're glad you got out. I want to talk about dinosaurs because I am a paleontologist by training. Mm -hmm. And one reason you mentioned this in the book, one reason we've, we've focused on chickens as the way to recreate, you know, a a morphologically an animal that looks like a dinosaur is because we've studied chickens extensively. We kind of know them backwards and forwards. We know how to breed them. We know how to keep them alive. We know they taste good if it doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, it makes sense that that's what the animal whose genetic code we would mess with first to try to create a simulacrum of a dinosaur. And I think, you know, the Michael Crichton frog DNA thing was just so he could have the sex switching dinosaurs on the island as a plot point. I think, you know, realistically, if you were going to use DNA for for plugging in gaps, you would use a, an archosaur, like a probably a basal archosaur, more like a crocodile or something like that. But and then and then you say that going to ostriches next makes sense, because if you want a bird big enough that you can ride, you want to turn that into a dinosaur and then ride around on the dinosaur. That all makes mm-hmm. sense. I want to pitch you a different bird, though, that you might or might not be aware of. <laughs> Have you heard of the Hotzine, a.k.a. the Reptile Bird, a.k.a. the Skunk Bird, a.k.a. Stink Bird, a.k.a. the Conhe Pheasant? I have not, but I will say this sounds like one person like really didn't like one particular bird and so made up all these unkind nicknames. <laughs> <laughs> they're really yeah they're really not not kind at all to the uh to the bird i put a link to the wikipedia page for this bird in the chat on zencaster if you can see that it's a, apparently a very noisy species it's i think it's very cool looking the thing that oh, yeah. makes it i think Gorgeous. an excellent candidate for reverse engineering into a dinosaur like animal is as a juvenile this bird still has fingers and the juvenile birds before they can fly they climb around the forest in the trees using their fingers that is remarkably unsettling and it is the it's the only bird that can give you the bird right ryan, <laughs> ryan why don't we just like make a robot dinosaur and then put a chicken brain in it and have the chicken Ooh. brain controlling the robot dinosaur now you're thinking like a super villain that's an excellent <laughs> suggestion ben I love Why that. do we not simply build a robot dinosaur <laughs> and stick a brain inside? Um, I talk about that briefly in the book where I'm talking about uh, immortality schemes and people are like, why do we not simply put our brains in computers or give ourselves robot bodies? Well, like, like AI is hard to program. Like to get like a robot that acts like a chicken, that takes a lot of work. But you could, if you could just like, you know, take an entire chicken head and then 
wire up its neurons and put a little camera so it sees out the robot's eyes. Now, Ben, I assume you're familiar with Mike the Headless Chicken. What? Oh, the, it lived a long time, right? Isn't that the yeah? It lived. I mean, it lived eyedropper for, food. Yeah. 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 It was. It was. Deca- it was a, for folks who don't know, Mike the Headless Chicken was a chicken in Farida, Colorado, that was decapitated by its owner. But and there's a, there's a fascinating element to this story. So basically, there was this farmer who had this this chickens, and his mother in law was coming for a visit, and they were gonna kill one of the chickens for dinner. And he knew that his mother-in-law, her favorite thing to nibble on was the chicken neck. And so when he went to behead the chicken, he was purposely aiming a little high because he was trying to preserve as much of the neck as possible for his mother-in-law. So he's trying to do a nice thing for his mother-in-law, but he ended up cutting through the chicken's brain and left the brainstem intact. So the chicken, you know, they talk, they talk about running around like a chicken with your head cut off, you know, the, the, the ax managed to miss the ve- the jugular vein and left the brainstem intact. So this chicken with no head did not die for months. It, it eventually choked on a piece of corn in its esophagus. It wasn't even, like, it never got, in, yeah, it never got infected. It never, it lived for two years without a head. And there's still a uh, Mike the Headless Chicken Festival in Fruit, Colorado every year <laughs> for, for folks in the Rocky Mountain region of Ben. in briefly with our excellent conversation with Brian Gord because it would not be an episode of Science Order if Ben and I did not tell you what we are drinking. Ben, I believe you have jumped the shark. Maybe you're drinking maybe you're drinking some sort of shark-based beverage. I don't know, but I heard you take a sip before we got to this point in the record. So oh, yeah. I'll let, I'll let you go first and, and tell the fine folks at home or not at home, out living their lives what it is you are enjoying or not enjoying. Since you I live moved, your life. Do what you since, want. The, since I moved to Cranbrook, B.C., the bulk of my episodes of Science sort of were rec- recorded in the Maritimes, where I had Asian grocery stores that stocked a lot of very exotic drinks. But since I moved to, to uh, Cranbrook, British Columbia, Canada, my choice of exotic drinks has been fairly limited. But but somebody was selling burdock tea at the Asian store. Well, I mean, the, the proprietors of the Asian grocery store were selling burdock tea. Do you know what burdock is, Ryan? I don't. I was literally typing it right. I was typing it right now. What is it coming? Well, it's a type of spiky bush that's all over North America. It looks like a milk thistle. Yeah. I don't know if it is a milk thistle because anything with roots is something I'm not very good at. I mean, it's it's family Asteraceae, which is one of the most speciose plant families, I believe. So it doesn't help me narrow it down much it, because once you get once you get below family level plants, I generally don't know what's going on. So yeah, this is a uh, it's a burdock is a t- it's this plant that makes this edible root, and the root gets used in a variety of I think it's slightly medicinal. I've looked it, gets, it up, and and milk thistle is also an asteraceae. So okay. I was I was actually, I mean, I at least under I at least identified that. Congratulations. I tried to grow a burdock bush in my backyard. Well, rather, it was growing like a weed in the alley, and I didn't cut it down because I had ambitions of digging up its root and eating it. It gets used a lot in Japanese cooking. Hmm. So I was very excited to eat the burdock. I still haven't had any locally grown burdock, and my mom told me that I'm being a foolish. But they sell burdock tea, and I think that it's ridiculous, and I can't wait to try it because... What what even is What it? are your thoughts on like Yeah. Cuz I feel like there's a definition of tea where it's made from the leaves of a tea plant. Yes. 
And then there's just like, I don't know, we just like soaked this thing in water until the water was a different color and then we drank it. Yeah, sure, tea. like herbal teas. I don't know. So there's an there, but, there's definitely but see, a But see if you're if you're if you're if you're soaking the root because like an herb to me is a leaf, right? The, to, right. to me, the, the distinction between herbs and spices in the Colonel's recipe for his delicious fried chicken is herbs are leaf, spices are any other part of the plant. Mm, is that so? I suppose. That's my, that's my understanding. So like cinnamon Seed pod, is the bark, is the bark, bark. right? Yep. So it's, it's, it's an er, it's a spice. Mm-hmm. Coriander seed is a spice. You plant coriander seed and wait for it to grow into cilantro. That's an herb because it's a leaf. Mm. But you know, people use like cinnamon in in herbal tea mixes. I'm just, no, stuff. I know, but I'm but I'm just saying. I don't. I don't think the. I, I think the term. We need a different term. I, I don't think we can come up with it here and now. But I'm just putting. Well, it out I mean, there. I think I think people refer to any th- like teas or herbal teas. I don't know. Moral of the story is this is actually tea. When I look at the ingredients, it's got burdock extract. And then some other flavor. It's got jujube concentrate, brown rice concentrate, and then some um, green tea extract. So technically, this is flavored green tea. So it's it's proper tea according to your definition. But it's um, yeah. All right. Let's... Have you ever had Have you ever had sassafras tea? No. That's a thing in Appalachia. Doing like Boy Scout camping trips, we used to make sassafras tea. And it's it's the root it's the root of the sassafras plant, and it historically was an ingredient in sarsaparilla and root beer. So it's tea that tastes like root beer. If you ever were interested in that, that sounds really good. It's really good. <laughs> okay, burdock tea. It's good, but it, it tastes very um very brown and earthy, kind of muddy but sweet and refreshing, etc. I mean, they they did put jujube extract into it. But you know what it tastes like is there are a variety of teas in Japan that are made of roasted seed pods. Like they have buckwheat tea and they have like... We, we actually just finished a bag of buckwheat tea here in our household and I need to go to the Japanese market in town and buy more. Oh yeah, no, it's good it's stuff. It's delicious. It's That's... so... But you're right, it's super roasty toasty. It's almost like it's almost like a, a hot glass of popcorn. Yeah. Mm. So that's what that's what this burdock tea, tea tastes like. Hmm. I thought it would taste more like burdock, which burdock tastes it's it tastes like what it tastes like, but it is a very earthy flavor, a very woody texture. So I I wasn't expecting the familiar taste of like buckwheat tea. Hmm. Well, I have a beer, as, as you might not be surprised to learn. There's the ooh, just all right. Well, I don't think I got anything on the computer. If we can continue. This beer is called, I thought this was a very appropriate beer for having Ryan North talking about his new villain book on the show. This beer is from Weathered Ground Brewery in Cool Ridge, West Virginia, which a lot of people say is currently the best brewery in West Virginia, but I haven't actually been to their facility. I've, I've drank a fair amount of their beer and it is quite good. I just can't speak to, you know, it's goat status. But this is an experimental IPA they did called Thespian Espionage. Hmm. That, that fits, right? Because, like, Ryan North's got some thespian energy, but, like, his book, his most recent book, is kind of espionage Yeah, yeah. I, get, I, I, I approve. Do you Thank think you. it's, like, a, a pun on, like, people who steal the show? That's an interesting idea. The little little paragraph they have about it, I won't read the whole thing, but they say occasionally a dramatic experiment becomes a brew house favorite, and that's exactly what happened with Thespian Espionage. Hmm. It so, was dramatic. Hmm. I won most dramatic superlative in high school. Do you do superlatives oh, really? up in Canada? We don't call it superlatives, but we do try to mimic it. So we had we had you could get nominated for various roles in the yearbook but it was mostly the yearbook committee like just Uh, having fun with all the submissions gotcha so ironically and importantly my twin sister let's see i think i you know what they they changed it but originally because my friend was on the yearbook committee and they didn't want to make me mad i guess i don't know they said they they wouldn't like you when you're angry yeah yeah my my superlative was supposed to be we did everyone get one or i think so maybe i can't remember it's been a long time but it was like i was like 
person most likely to destroy the world. And then my si- my twin sister, who graduated at the same time, is going to be the person most likely to keep her brother from destroying the world. That's pretty funny. Yeah, pretty I funny. thought so. I was. I, I mean, I, s- speaking of the guy who was voted most likely to take over the world, should we get no. back to our conversation with Messier Ryan North? Yeah. All right, let's, let's do that then. got a question about your book okay so you talk about the buckminster fuller giant floating cities yes right and then you talk about the rigidity of different materials if you're going to build one of these things yes right why doesn't the air pressure of the warmer air inside the bubble just and i'm asking you this because presumably you've read enough about it that you that you can't answer. I, I'm not expecting that you can do the calculation right right now. But mm-hmm. why, why doesn't the air pressure just hold the hold the thing up? Why does it? Why does the material have to sustain its own weight? Isn't that isn't that like a thing with really large balloons too, Ben? Though isn't there like a weight to weight to buoyancy ratio that you have to maintain in order for like even a really large weather balloon to float? Well, I don't know. I think there is. I think like there's a thing about because I know I know from like rock climbing, people often underestimate the weight of the rope while rock climbing if you're if you're lead climbing and you're not like top roping right so it's you know the further up you climb the more the rope is actually pulling you back down because the rope itself is heavier and heavier as it comes off the ground and so i think there's like a similar thing with balloons and presumably science fiction floating cities where like it, it's that it's that goddard rocket rocket equation right like the more fuel you need to keep the thing aloft the heavier the thing then becomes and it becomes this sort of cascading they problem need more of, fuel yeah yeah mm. okay I don't know. I, I'm I'm just thinking out loud here. It's a good question. Mm. I'm just not sure. I, I have a, a good. I I don't. This Ryan doesn't have a good answer. Okay. <laughs> well, I was asking that Ryan. That's the that's the nice thing about this conversation is that I only need to remember one noun. Yeah, you have a backup. <laughs> Any question you ask, there's a backup Ryan on the line, ready to ready to contribute. Speaking more about like comic book supervillains, this is something I've thought about a lot, and I've never had a supervillain expert to ask about it. So I'm sure Magneto, the Joker, Shredder, Megatron. Why are there so many purple supervillains? Is there, is purple the most villainous color? Is there something else going on here that purple seems to pop up in supervillainy costume? Yeah, I can tell you my theory. I think there's two reasons. The first is that purple is a rare color in nature. And so you stand out, which is a super, what a supervillain wants to do. And the second is the historical expense of producing the color purple was so high through through much of history that it was a regal color. And so usually supervillains tend towards the world domination bent. And then you're going to dress yourself like someone who stands out and looks like a king and or queen. And that that puts you in purple in a lot of cultures. It's weird. It, it is actually legitimately strange to me that Dr. Doom doesn't have any purple in his costume, especially when a lot of the Fantastic Four, you know, you got Kang, you got Galactus, like purple, you know, it, he is a legitimate monarch and yet he has no purple. Yeah, I think Doom being, in my opinion, objectively the greatest supervillain, he breaks the mold a bit. He goes his own way and that's part of what makes him so spectacular. Like, yes, purple is the obvious choice but because it's so obvious 
Doom goes for a forest green cape. <laughs> cape and open skirted tunic. <laughs> and yeah, open skirted tunic with a sensible belt. It's just around the, the waist. I, I also <laughs> like he breaks the mold in so many ways. You know, he he runs his own nation. He's an absolute, literally an iron fisted dictator. Mm-hmm. But to overcome, you know, you talk about the problem that you're always going to have lackeys as a dictator and you have to keep those lackeys in line. And he even circumvented that problem. He just built doom bots. He's just got robots that look like him <laughs> to do whatever he wants. Ryan, I've got a big, important question. Is Dr. Doom's mouth always open? And if not, why does he have that little grate inside of his mouth? So the joy of comics is that artists can, I don't want to call it cheating, but they have the option to break the rules a little bit. I used to love reading the early Iron Man comics. He's presumably wearing this metal mask that should not emote. And then when he's (laughs) surprised... He has a surprise expression on his face. None of this makes sense. Even if he was, even if he did have a mask that can change shape, why would Iron Man want to show his enemies when he's alarmed or startled? (laughs) It's it's wild. (laughs) And and Spider-Man cheats all the time. His eyes change shape. And in the, the MCU, they gave him mechanical eyes to explain why they wanted this character to emote and squint and look surprised. So it's kind of a concession to we want our characters to have facial expressions, but we also want them to look super awesome. And so, yes, Doom wears his metal mask with his permanently open mouth scowl on it. But I'm sure you could find panels in which he has it closed or maybe he sips a a straw through there to eat. I'm not 100 percent sure how that works. Maybe the grate comes out. I worry a lot about Dr. (laughs) Doom being able to eat. I yeah. I think he has really pale skin from never seeing the sunlight. <laughs> never seeing the sunlight. I and I mean and also you know Jack Kirby was a genius and whatever he did was probably the correct thing. So <laughs> that's the other answer <laughs> to that question. I think. Are you familiar with the theory, Ryan, that original? You know the whole the reason Doctor Doom wears the the full iron suit is because he had a lab accident that he blames Reed Richards for disfigurement. Was, yeah, disfigurement. But there was this idea in the early days of the Fantastic Four that like if they ever revealed Dr. Doom's face, it was going to be like he had just an ever so slightly tiny scar. Yeah. But his vanity was such that that was enough that he thinks he's a monster. But it seems like, you know, they've retconned that where like, no, he actually is like really badly burned underneath there. But I kind of, I don't know. I kind of think part of me thinks that it's a better story if he has only a very slight disfigurement. What do you, what do you think? I, yeah, I love the thing with what makes Dr. Doom so great is that he is always just on the edge of being relatable. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I think I understand Dr. Doom. And then he does something completely wild. And so the idea of him like having a tiny scar and wearing a mask for the rest of his life kind of fits in with who you might think Dr. Doom is. But the new version where he made this mask and he was so excited, he put it on his face before it cooled and that disfigured him. Oh, also kind of works. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good call too. Like, I also, I also just think Jack Kirby for all of his talent wasn't particularly great at drawing people who look objectively attractive like there's a great scene in fourth world where you know orion the son of dark side but raised by high father on new genesis reveals his true face and it's like he's not that much uglier than he was when <laughs> jack kirby was just drawing him normal <laughs> like i think that was maybe just not yeah. quite his strong suit he's not really drawing handsome stud muffins all the time <laughs> ironically except for reed richards who in the original comics is not the spindly nerd but is a square jawed you know <laughs> Gonna, like gonna... most, yeah, peak 50s dad guy. Mm-hmm. I think he has a, a cigar, not a cigar, a pipe in some of them. Like he's just, he's just everyone's 1950s dad. Yeah. Ben and I actually both came up with the same question that we wanted to ask you in terms of having written a bunch of actual, you know, supervillains in the comic book world. I'll let Ben ask the sure. question, but I'll preface it by saying I was talking to Kieran Gillen once about like when you're writing Iron Man, you're theoretically writing a character who's smarter than you. And so how yes. do you as a person who's dumber than the character you're writing, come up with smart things to do for that character. And his response was, well, I've got more time because, you know, Tony is figuring this stuff out instantly and I just have to sit on it for a week and go with it. But Ben, do you want to, do you want to? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I was, I was hoping you wanted to ask it at the same time to see if we could see. Oh, let's do that. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. It's okay. You've already (laughs) brought me up. Okay. So, okay. You you got this, buddy. So, okay. Okay. Have you ever written a villain story like a plot a scheme scheme a scheme that would just win and like you there was no way to stop it and so you were like oh yeah it's just kind of girl gonna like maybe not do this one (laughs) (laughs) it's funny because writing squirrel girl she's the unbeatable squirrel girl she always wins 
But I had the same problem that Kieran had with Iron Man, where she is a smart young woman and she has to be clever enough to to see solutions. And so it was less the villains came up with plots that were too too clever and more I knew that she would have a clever solution for this. <laughs> so I had to figure out what it was. And yeah, it was the same thing of, of taking more time. Usually the the villains, the fun thing there is you just give in to your worst impulses and you say, what would someone smart and angry, but really channeling that anger into productive means do? <laughs> what's What's the worst version of me doing here? And for some reason, I find that really easy to imagine. And the trickier part is saying, what is the best version of me? How could the best version of me fix that in a way that leaves everyone happy? How could the best version of me stop that from hurting other people and the villain themselves and try to find some way forward? So it's it's kind of, you know, just like how my comic Dinosaur Comics, it's it's T-Rex and u traps are talking and me figuring, seeing both sides of the issue a lot of the time. Writing a superhero comic is me trying to be my best self and my worst self <laughs> all day long. And when you were working on Squirrel Girl, did you have to give the artist reference photography of Ben to get him in the scene or how did that work? Yeah. So when I wrote Ben into the comic, I'm in the that's comic. what I like to do. Yeah. I said, this guy is a professor. He's teaching school and here's a bunch of photos of him. And please make sure he has all these details so that it's clearly Ben. And Erica Henderson, the artist, just just nailed it. it was fantastic. I, was like, I didn't know it was that easy to just put my friends into comic books. <laughs> I would be doing this way more often. Yeah. Well, Erica Henderson is also an excellent artist. She's so good yes. on that book. So that, 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 that helps to have an amazing artist to work with. Since, since, <laughs> Never uh, hurts. since Squirrel Girl came up and we're talking about unfoilable plots, I got to praise you for the, for the time Squirrel Girl fought King the Conqueror. Oh, that was a fun book. Oh, that was genius. <laughs> okay, so what Ryan realized is that the reason King the Conqueror, King of the Conqueror is a bad guy who comes from the future with knowledge about the hero he's going to fight. And so he has more knowledge about... Future knowledge. Future, future knowledge. knowledge. He has also more... potentially a descendant of Reed Richards or Doctor Doom. It's or both. They probably just fall in love in the future. I, I, yeah. Hopefully. Reed Richards is all flexy. Anyway, so he, Ryan's like, you know what? <laughs> Kang's Kang... He's going to try to fight Squirrel Girl and then kind of fail and then go back in time and try it again to, to earlier and earlier versions of Squirrel Girl. And what Ryan realized is that Kang's advantage of having future knowledge diminishes every time he interacts with a previous Squirrel Girl. The future Squirrel Girl gets more information about what Kang is about to do. And so it's a it's a neat like inversion of Kang's advantage over the Squirrel Girl because the obvious thing, which is to go back before, reduces his capacity to to win. Oh, so smart, Ryan. Thank you. But yeah, Kang keeps like... going to earlier and earlier versions. Like, I'll get her when she's younger. I'll, I'll kill her when she's a kid. That'll make it easier. But he's, he's making it harder for himself. It was, I mean, I remember writing that issue and I was sitting in a, I was waiting for a flight just being like, how can I write a Kang story? <laughs> this guy is so powerful. But the nice thing about a Kang story is that he's he's just, he's Mr. Time Travel. And he starts thinking of like, what's a crazy time travel I haven't seen done before? And if I have time travel powers, what's the best way I can exploit that? That's what we're talking about, where he's doing the, the angry, pettiest thing. I'll just kill her when she's a kid. And Squirrel Girl's doing the smart thing that realizing that every encounter she has, she gets more knowledge. And so they're, they're, it's kind of an equilibrium. It can balance out. And Kang doesn't have the advantage he thinks he does, even though he can travel through time. K yeah. Kang never has the advantage he thinks he has. That's the entire point of Kang, the character. <laughs> if you name yourself Kang the Conqueror, you're probably not that good at conquering. Like was, He has to, to tell people that he's a really good conqueror, even though he's kind of not. I was so well, happy reading that. I was like, yes, look at the symmetry. Look at the symmetry <laughs> Ryan North understands about time travel. <laughs> thank you ben that's great to hear well i i'm a huge kang fan and i think we're living in a bit of a kang renaissance right now we haven't i, I think the doom renaissance is next ryan it's oh gosh be, i sure right? hope so but in terms of you've written for both marvel and dc so hopefully this is not a loaded question if you're unable to answer i understand but sure. who has the best villains marvel dc or some other shared comic book universe that nobody's even talking about right now gosh i think when you ask the general public they think of 
Batman's villains and maybe Lex Luthor, right? You've got the Joker, you've got Poison Ivy, you've got my personal favorite, though he's less popular, Clock King, you've got Riddler, like all the... When people think of supervillains, they tend to go to the Batman's rogues gallery. And Spider-Man's got like Dr. Octopus, Green Goblin, and a bit of them. But like with Dr. Doom being the notable exception of being clearly the best, I feel like DC has the more charismatic ones, the ones that tend to lean into a gimmick. That was what we think of. When the lay person thinks of supervillain, they think, here's someone who's got a trick. You've got your Mr. Freeze with his freeze gun or Poison Ivy with her plants or Joker with his electrocuting handshakes and all these, these gimmicks. Well, Marvel is tend to be more the, the tragic figures, the scientists whose experiments backfired and they lost their minds or people who have suffered losses. So there's different flavors of supervillains and they go in different directions. But if you're just asking like, who's got the best across everything in the interest of future employment, I would say they're both tied for first. Ah, I love that. I think that makes perfect <laughs> sense. I, I think you're right. You know, people do go to Batman. I think if you're going to rank rogues galleries, it's Batman, Spider-Man, Flash are your top three by, you know, and I think they're kind of the top three by a mile. I don't think there's anyone else who really compares, but you know, I feel like Marvel does a really good job of like having a, a character or a team have like the one great villain that is like unimpeachably awesome. Like your Magneto for the X-Men like, it's a guy who survived the Holocaust and is kind of right about most of what he believes, but he's just a yeah. dick. Like, you know, he just <laughs> doesn't, he doesn't go about his schemes in an appropriate way. And there's an argument to be made for, for Lex Luthor. Definitely Dr. Isley, you know, Poison Ivy. Like, she's right. Like, we should not be cutting down plants as much as we are. Like, <laughs> well, she's the hero. She is 100% the hero in my books. I, I love her. And and it's it's just really interesting to me that if you look at Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster's original idea for Superman, it is much more of a Lex Luthor character than they originally than they eventually got published. Like it's a guy who's so smart that he's a problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then they kind of were like, well, let's tone that down and make him sort of a circus strong man turned up to eleven. And that's where we got, you know, Clark Kent. Yeah. I mean, how to take over the world. I dedicated that book to Poison Ivy. <laughs> well, you dedicated and you dedicated this book to Lex, which I assume is Luthor, Victor, who's mm -hmm. Dr. Freeze, Eric, which I assume you met Magneto, and then Dr. Isley. Um, yep. so are they just your favorites, or is there any particular reason that they got a shout out in this book? Or what's the, the sort of thing in there? Yeah, I wanted I wanted to dedicate to the villains. And the funny thing with Victor is I actually met Victor Von Doom, but I have a brother who's also named Victor. And huh. so when my dad got the book, he flipped the dedication and was like, How come Victor gets dedicated here and not me? And I was like, No, Dad, read the full dedication. And he's like, I don't know who who Lex is or Dr. Isley. Do you know what Dr. Isley? Tell me about Dr. Isley. I'm like, Dad, they're they're villains. <laughs> Lex Luthor, Victor Von Doom, or Victor Freeze. I it's it's you don't have to feel bad about it, Dad. So it was a smooth way to to dance around that and get out of trouble. And is is it supposed to be Eric Lyncher? Am I getting that right? Yep, yep. That everything else was right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, another question I had, sort of getting away from the realm of comic books, although I think we could talk about comics for for days. We didn't even get into the the Midas book you wrote, which is one of my favorite sci fi comics out there. But ben helped a lot on that. Oh, did you, Matt? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. I yeah, know. he was my science consultant. Oh, well, let's talk about it. Well, then by all means, let's <laughs> talk about it a little bit. So Midas is a book that sort of takes the myth of King Midas more seriously. So he's a guy who wishes everything he touches turns to gold, and it kind of follows electricity rules. So if he's touching it, it turns to gold, or if he's touching something that touches it, it turns to gold. And so the whole planet Earth turns to gold, and then Midas dies because the air touching his lungs turns to gold and he can't respirate. And then as his body cools, it still has this effect. And so the Earth's atmosphere eventually settles as, as little flakes of dust. And then thousands of years in the future, there's these this solid gold planet that's discovered with this terrible weapon where if you cut off cut up Midas's flesh with with light, with lasers and then drop it on a world, you've got a, a charge that you can draw from orbit that would destroy a planet. And so it becomes this space opera of dealing with a totalitarian regime in space and trying to destroy it with this, this miracle weapon that's also incredibly dangerous and becomes this sort of meditation uh, <laughs> on violence and weapons. And Ben was, I said, um, I asked him, I said, can I ask you a question, Ben? And he said, sure. And I said, okay, here's the thing. If you were to turn anything into gold, how could that happen? What would that look like? And Ben said, well, it wouldn't happen. 
But if it were to happen, here's what would it would be. <laughs> and gave me this this scientific rationale for how it could happen, which I used in the book for explaining the process and why it wasn't reversible and how it was powered. And it was just the right amount of actual science to make a science fantasy story go down smooth. I honestly think like in the evolutionary history of humans, I think Ben's brain has achieved like the perfect balance of actual knowledge and ability to tolerate nonsense enough to help people tell stories. I mean, my big (laughs) problem reading the current book, how to take over the world is I keep coming up with ways to like take over the world and stuff. I'm like, what if we did this? No, Ben, that's evil. (laughs) <laughs> it's, also, it's also helpful to know that, that that ben is lazy enough that we don't think i don't think we actually have to worry that much about ben being yeah that's the safety so. valve yeah. <laughs> actually, are you, were you ever concerned at all that that somebody would you were, enact you were sharing one of these forbidden knowledge yeah because like you talk about how to like disable the internet and like you know yeah Stuff like that. Yeah. So my first, my first thought was, well, I wrote the book and I priced everything out, and it turned, came in at under a little under fifty six billion dollars. So I thought, great, no one has fifty six billion dollars of individual wealth. And then I looked at the list of Forbes billionaires, and there are twenty people alive today who could do every scheme in this book and have money left over. So I was like, oh darn. But the honest answer is that, like, a None of these are secrets. Like when I talk about the vulnerability of computers for elections, these vulnerabilities have been known since the 80s, since Ken Thompson wrote Reflections on Trusting Trust. And so there's nothing there that is is privileged. It's just not commonly known. And then that chapter, especially where I talk about destroying the internet, the main goal there is to try to make this argument that you should never trust computers for anything that you can't check and fix and elections aren't the kind of thing you can do a do over easily afterwards without causing massive social unrest and so yes we do banking online and yes you can use an app order a pizza and yes it's a huge pain to go down to a voting booth in person and vote on a piece of paper like a caveman would but there's a reason for that and when you start to to carve away those those barriers really catastrophic things happen and then we can talk about stuxnet worm or the volkswagen emission scandal or all these things in which you the this fantasy stuff where you think no would ever do that has been done because it's really profitable or at least it had the chance to be so Mm -hmm. i i if the question is like is this book dangerous i feel like no but it's good to know about the stuff in here and it's it leads to some really interesting questions and and facts about the world we share. That one particular chapter, there's two chapters in this that are literally a public service where you're where I was like, wow, Ryan, <laughs> you're you're t- you're taking it to the hoop for the rest of us. There was the one about cheating on elections and the one about global warming. That one was mm-hmm. the global warming chapter was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, that was that was the chapter about uh, controlling the weather for the perfect crime. And that was the one where I wanted to make sure that there were clearly delimited downsides because the the plot in the book, the heist, is to basically go up to the stratosphere and spray out some sulfur dioxide to reflect some sunlight, which would cool the planet down to pre-industrial levels. And, you know, there's some benefits. There's some huge colossal downsides, the main one being that now there is a global thermostat controlled by one person or one country or whatever and that means there's not a tornadoes aren't active acts of god anymore they could be blamed on you and that's a huge recipe for <laughs> global conflict and that the, the thing that it has been priced out and you could you're all in on seven billion dollars in startup costs and two billion annually to keep this going it's a kind of thing where i feel like it feels almost inevitable that at some point someone will put this forward and say, I could do this. I can save the world here. And I think it's good to understand not just the technological downsides, but the sociological downsides of that, of once you change the world's climate in a way you can control, then there's someone to blame whenever something bad happens. (laughs) And that seems really unstable to me. Well, the thing, the thing I actually loved about the climate change chapter was the group chat on the message board. (laughs) Yeah, that was so good. So you basically pr- present the entire history of life on Earth as a group chat on a problematic internet forum. And I really liked the way that cyanobacteria 
explained that like, oh, us releasing all this oxygen in the atmosphere is going to be fine because there's going to be iron, there's going to be drawdown. And I'd never, me as a person who has like studied climate and tries to like explain climate change to people in ways that get them to want to take action. Like I'm an advocate for, you know, taking action on climate change. I mm-hmm. never connected mentally the idea of the the banded iron formations that formed when oxygen producing life first evolved with sort of the carbon dioxide silicate weathering cycle drawdown that we're inevitably going to be reliant upon to get all the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So like mm-hmm. thinking about those two events as sort of two sides of the same coin was never something I thought about before, but was makes perfect sense and was absolutely revelatory in the way I'm going to explain the problem of climate change to people from now on. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting, right? Because from our point of view, it was a good thing because we, we use that oxygen, but it was a huge and like literally catastrophic change to the Earth's climate. And it's sort it's, of- It's the biggest mass extinction event that we never talk about. Because it worked out for us. It was it was beneficial for our form of life. And so we tend to see it as it was a long time ago. And it kind of feels like no harm, no foul. But it was this huge change to the planet caused by life on Earth, changing things in the atmosphere. Changing the atmosphere. Yeah. We had Peter Brannon on who wrote the, was it The Ends of the Worlds? Was that the name of his book? I'm trying to remember the name of his book. Fantastic book that kind of recaps all the major mass extinctions that have happened on planet Earth. Oh, yes, I've read that book. It's great. It's great. He, I mean, yeah, great, great title, book. too. Excellent title. And he's a really good speaker and writer. And the thing that struck me, I was, I was striked by that book, was the idea that other, except for the asteroid hitting 66 million years ago, every single mass extinction on Earth since then, before then and since, has been caused by an imbalance of carbon in the atmosphere in one direction or the other, right? Yeah. We either ice ball Earth or we hothouse Earth, and it causes big problems. Yeah, if you look at the history of Earth, we tend to think of it as being basically, you know, high level, life evolves, dinosaurs show up, asteroid kills them, we show up, the end. But there's actually this cadence of catastrophe where things go wrong often, and there's no reason to believe that you know, we will be the ones immune to disaster and that we will be the last things to evolve on Earth. Like there's, there's no guarantees, I think is what history teaches us. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, a question I thought in, in wrapping things up, is there someone in actual history who's come the closest to the type of supervillain that you're coaching in this book? The kind of villain who ends up doing maybe a service to humanity, but through outside of the, the normal you know course of, of politics and science means? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I'm sure others are like shaking their heads. Like, of course, it's this person I idolize. But when you ask that question, I thought of the closest person I thought to an actual supervillain, which I mentioned in the book, Thomas Midgley Jr., who uh, was instrumental in both chloroform carbons and leaded gasoline and so did more to harm life on this planet than any other person possibly in history and he did it by accident (laughs) so i would put him under like potential supervillains what could he do if he was really trying but for those who are doing the sort of enlightened supervillain in my book people who better the world by operating outside existing power structures to get things done on their own that's not being done otherwise i'm not sure i feel like the core of it is making the world a better place and not asking for permission first. And I feel like that's a lot of really scientists, right? Like they're, I always love this idea of a scientist as someone who is curious about the world and wants to, wants to do something, wants to make it better. And they don't ask for permission. Science is not at its best. It's not authoritarian. It's doing stuff on your own and seeing what happens. So I guess your friendly local scientist is who I, who I'd nominate for that. I love that. So, Ben, you're the real hero here the whole time. Oh, no, I think Enrico Fermi is probably the closest to our science, super science villain. Yeah, but he was, I mean, he had to secretly be an alien, right? He's just no like, way. yeah. There's, but there's no way that guy was human. <laughs> like, let's just make a nuclear pile. It'll be fun. <laughs> it, it, it's all right. He is the, you know, I think he doth protest too much of like, where are the aliens? I've never seen one. I'm definitely not an alien. <laughs> Look at this equation that proves I'm not an alien. <laughs> right? It's, 
no, there's definitely no aliens here <laughs> monitoring this this primitive sapien species as we develop nuclear weapons. Not not me. That's not my job. I wasn't assigned by the Galactic Council to do that. I do like the protest too much angle uh, on Twitter. I always like to protest, claim that I'm not DB Cooper. And <laughs> I, 99% of the people get it as a riff. It's a joke. We're having fun. There's like 1% that look into it and they're like, you were born in 1980 and D.B. Cooper was in 1976. There's no way you could be. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, we should all stop looking into me. I'm not D.B. Cooper. <laughs> I know the average amount about him. <laughs> if anything, Enrico Fermi was D.B. Cooper just trying to get home. Yeah, look into him. He's the just guilty party. I'm just, a, out of planes. <laughs> I'm just an innocent fellow. As the Loki miniseries taught us anything, it was, you know, the reason we never found D.B. Cooper is because he was beamed up on the Rainbow Bridge back to Asgard. <laughs> Very credible theory. So, like, my favorite chapter in this whole book is Ryan trying to answer the question, how do you get somebody in a distant future and he jumps from a hundred years, 10 years to a hundred years to a thousand years to 10,000 years to a million years, right? And you use different things like he you carve your name into a into a giant piece of plastic and throw it in the Marianas trench. <laughs> yeah, that's really clever. But yeah, okay, so what you do, if you want if you want to broadcast something out into the universe that will be noticeable forever, is you get yourself one of those nuclear reactors from the first chapter and then you start pulsing out a message with it. And if you're doing it at a, at a neutrino emission scale that doesn't match the energy scale that neutrinos get made in the sun. So neutrino detectors can tell the difference between different sources of neutrinos in terms of like how much energy. So if they'll get like a, a neutrino come bouncing in and they'll be like, oh, this one comes from the sun because it's this energy level. Mm -hmm. So you do it with your nuclear reactor at a different energy level and you pulse out your message with that and it won't get absorbed like, uh, you know, electromagnetic radiation as it as it travels out into the universe it'll just, it'll just pass through things and as it passes through one civilization after another you know only a small percentage of the neutrinos will get absorbed by those people and so your your message will just propagate out into eternity i like it i like uh, it a lot sorry i've been i've been thinking about this chapter a lot and the different things you could do you we should we should delete me saying this why <laughs> i don't know <laughs> It's kind of it's random. <laughs> yeah, I think you, it's fun. Have, have you met you, Ben? Yeah. <laughs> like not. that that was the joy of that chapter is you start looking at these larger time uh, scales and you st start considering more and more seemingly impossible things you have to get towards larger and larger schemes to have any hope of communicating across these vast distances of time and space and that's exactly what you were doing there is being like okay, well if I can if I get enough neutrinos at the right power, then they'll be different than the sun and that you can stand out and communicate with that. That's that's the core of everything the book is, I think, yeah. is is trying to use science to accomplish comic book schemes. I love this book. It was great. In fact, I gave I gave I got two copies. Ryan, did you send oh. me a copy of your book? I might have. Yes, I think I put you on the list. You send me a copy of your book. Oh, thank you. I thought it was the publisher I, that Ryan Hopp sent me one. So I got two copies and I gave one of them to my one of my students. I said, here. That's great. That, uh, that, that puts you in as like best teacher. Thank you for giving me a copy of your book, Ryan. Thank you for liking it. So you end the book with acknowledgments. And so that's where I want yes. to end this interview. I just noticed you have John Sung in here. Is that Ferocious Jay, John Sung? That <laughs> small world, that is Ferocious Jay. Oh my gosh, he's a buddy of mine too. That's a, hilarious. Well, hi, John, if you're listening. I also I also have hi, met John. Marguerite Bennett at comic book conventions as well, which I think I think you and I met, Ryan, at a comic book convention, probably like WonderCon or something from mm -hmm. back when it was still in the Bay Area. But I wanted, I wanted to say that at the end of the book, you give what you claim is your only sincere piece of advice, which is to make friends with Kelly and Zach Wiener Smith. And Ben and I have already <laughs> done that. So like, we good? Yeah, I think you're set for life there. Right? It was this realization I had, because, you know, you in middle school, you my experience was I was a pretty clever guy. And then I got to high school and some people have this, some people smarter than me have this realization in university or grad school. But I was in high school and I was like, I'm no longer the cleverest guy here. 
And I had built my whole identity on being in my head. My whole identity was being the smart guy who, you know, liked science fiction, read science books. And I couldn't be the smartest guy anymore. If I don't have that, then who am I? What's left? But as an adult with a much more mature self-image and view of the world, uh, I love having friends who are way smarter than me. <laughs> Kelly and Zach are right up there. Yeah, Kelly and Zach are great. Ben was talking in our notes for this episode about their their upcoming book, which I hope we can get an interview. Kelly on Facebook and Instagram has been like talking about the research they've been doing on their upcoming book. Their last book was about like future technologies like nuclear fusion and stuff. Their upcoming book is going to be about like space stuff, right? Mm -hmm. The space book. Yeah, the space book. And as I was reading through space stuff through your book, Ryan, I was like, oh, hey, this kind of reminds me of the stuff Zach and Kelly have been working on. And then I read it in the back and I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, actually, they were in the chapter about starting your own secret base and the trouble with people there. I had been discussing Biosphere 2 and, and work in Antarctic bases. And Zach and Kelly were like, yeah, we've been looking at that, too, for our space book. And here's some cool stuff. And let's let's share notes. Let's do all this interesting stuff, which is is great. It's It's so kind and so selfless. And I love that whether we're talking about like supervillains on Earth or the challenges of living in space, it has this large set of overlapping problems, which come down to human nature. <laughs> I love the Biospheres 2 stuff that you put in it. And also that there wasn't a Biosphere 1. I, I learned so much about Biosphere 2, Ryan, and it made me so happy. <laughs> it's an incredible... It's The thing I love about Biosphere 2 is that it feels comic booky, right? It is a super rich person who's curious about how long, if humans can build a self-sustaining environment, separate from earth and so just builds it this is this is a super villain idea of like i'm not going to ask permission i'm just going to do it and so they do it and they lock people in this 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 base for two years and just kind of see what happens and what happens is they all kind of go a little crazy and it turns out they weren't getting enough food and enough oxygen so there's reasons for that but like a group of eight friends go in and by the time a year has gone by they half aren't talking to the other half and they're like spitting in each other's faces and the level of hate from just being locked with these people for so long is wild and incredible and so interesting as a scientist 20 years removed from it, curious about how long you can keep people alive in a secret base. Did, have you watched the Paul rewatched the Pauly Shore movie since learning <laughs> all this about it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I regret to say that I have still not yet made time for the Poly Shore vehicle from the 90s biodome in my life, but tell me what I missed. I yeah. haven't seen it yet. I oh, I've seen it. I, was, I watched it. I watched it back in the day. I mean, not when it came out, but like I think when I was in high school. So, it's, you know, it's a Poly Shore comedy where he gets trapped in the biodome. It's no it's no Encino man with <laughs> <laughs> with fan favorite Brendan Fraser. Yeah, he's great. He's sincerely great. He's I I love Brendan Fraser to the to the moon and back. Uh, super villain I would super villain scheme to save Brendan Fraser from harm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for for joining us to talk about your book and all the other nonsense we tossed your way while chatting about it. Happy to do it. I'm happy to come by every 300 episodes or even sooner if you'll have me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it has been just over 300 episodes since your first appearance. We're we're pretty sure you've had a second appearance, but I wasn't able to track it down at time. So go to <laughs> episode 44 of this year podcast from July 12th, 2010. Wow. How about that? That was the one where I was drinking Tiger Malt, right? You know what? I don't have it's not in the show notes. We we talked about dinosaur comics. We talked about Americans have beers and Canadians have other stuff, some more interesting in beer. Let's click to some more interesting in beer. Tiger Malt. Yep, you're right, Ben. So I can remember that. And then How do you we talked about that, Ben. Computer because I mean, he because he wasn't drinking alcohol. He it was, was very gross. Malt. <laughs> and I think we I think we talked about like the the what's that the Von Itch manuscript? Oh, yes, yeah. which has since been proven as not a language. I mean, that's exactly what the supervillain who made it would want you to think. Oh, darn. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ryan, where can people find you on the internet? I will say that in the show notes for this episode that are available on sciencesort of.com, we have links to purchase your book, How to Take Over the World, 
those links will be to bookshop.org, which is a affiliate partner for us. So you will get that book from a local bookstore to you mm -hmm. and not from a large river in South America that ships books, apparently. <laughs> and so we would encourage people to go check out that affiliate link to purchase the book that way or get it from your local library. But Ryan, yeah. where else can people find you on this World Wide Web of ours? You can find Dinosaur Comics, my comic that I'm still doing at dinosaurcomics.com. And my personal website is ryannorth.ca. And the only social media I'm really on is Twitter, where I post all sorts of silly jokes. And that is at Ryan Q North. Q for quality. <laughs> <laughs> I, was try I was trying to come up with a Q joke that wasn't just QAnon. And I think quality is actually <laughs> Q for QAnon. <laughs> thank you. Thank you yeah. so much for joining us, Ryan. It was, a, it was a delight. And we really enjoyed talking with you. And Thank you. Yeah, I'd like now to direct the conversation towards QAnon, where I have a lot of facts to well, share. Well, look Good at for your listeners. Uh, yeah, so we we're this interview has already run a little long. We're just going to go ahead and cut things <laughs> off here. Uh, no, that was fantastic. Thanks, Ryan. You're the best. Well, thank you so much to Ryan for giving us some of his time to talk about his new book. Always a delight to have Ryan back on the show. I would say it, it is not a far stretch to say he's one of my favorite repeat guests. He's cool. We don't have a ton of repeat guests, but he's up there. He's in the, I would say he's on the Mount Rushmore of science sort of repeat guests. Good guy and a good talker about the things that we like talking about on this show. But the other people that we like to feature in talking about what we talk about on this show are you, the listeners and the viewers and the creeps. So without further ado, let us walk over to the final corner of this show where we delight in feedback from our varied listeners in the segment that we call The Paleo Pow. Pow. Paleo Pal is the listener feedback segment. Ben, you're up first. Hello. My Paleo Pal is from somebody named Brandon. Brandon wrote an email. Was that this year they wrote this? Yeah. Yes. Wow. It's about episode 214, the live show where everybody met Ben, it says. Uh, Brandon says, I like the live show, and I was excited to know Ben wasn't just a voice in a garage. No, I'm a voice in your head. However, a concern has come to mind. I believe Kelly or you mentioned he had moved from the garage to an android body, but I'm not sure if that's what could have happened. It's possible Ben has now copied his operating system and how it's now made multiple versions of himself. The implications are unclear, but it could go south very quickly. Anyway, I'm really enjoying catching up on the show, and I kind of miss trailer trash talk but not overly. It's also great to hear the music you put in since it's dated now, but in a good way. I hope you, Julie, and little Ryan are doing well. Yes, well, uh, to alleviate your fears, I'm a quantum computer. Oh, wow. Yeah, and the thing about quantum teleportation of information, which is how I got my operating system into the Android body, is that it can't duplicate the information. So there's only ever one copy of my operating system wherever it is. So you don't need to worry about that, about there being more than one of me, and neither do I. So good and news. One other thing I want to point out from a, a, a different email from Brandon, because we always ask what people's listening styles are to podcasts. He filled us in on that too. So he said, to respond to my listening style, typically I listen to a few of the newest episodes of the podcast and then go back to the beginning. So that's... For our show, he listened to 339 immediately, then went back all the way to the beginning. So he's only up to 189, at least at the time of writing this email, which was a little while ago. So maybe closer to the, the finish line by now, maybe hearing this, this recitation of his writings a little more close to release. But either way, Brandon, 
glad you're here. Glad you're enjoying it. And we've done a few trailer trash talks recently. Ben, is there a movie that's come out or a movie that's upcoming that you would want to do a trailer trash talk on? Oh boy, that's upcoming. Um, um, I don't know how much you follow um, what's coming out. Um, Little Mermaid. Um, um, um. I don't know. I think all the movies I'm looking forward to watching came out like three years ago. What's the best like? If what's the best movie you've seen recently that we could do a science or a theater on? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, 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 uh. I don't know the answer to that, Ryan. I can't remember anything I've done for the last three years. It's a big. So you gotta problem. get on. You gotta get a letterbox so you can keep keep tally of all the movies you've seen. Honestly, I you know now that we live in the era of tabulating everything you do so you can compare it with everybody, I should have done a lot more things, but I can't remember anything I've done. Well, at least twenty twenty one's looking nice. <laughs> Got to be better than this year, right? Sure. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I gotta see what movies are coming out. I'm sure I have an opinion here somewhere. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of insane to not have an opinion on this, you know. It's a... Well, I mean, like, I haven't been in a theater in forever. No, neither have I. Neither have I. You know what? It, it Maybe Matrix Resurrections. Did you see that? No. That's not that's not upcoming, but like that's that's the most recent movie I've seen that I think would make for a good science or a theater. Oh yeah, that Maybe, except that I, I heard it was kind of bad. We should watch Avatar. <laughs> I actually liked, I, I liked Matrix Resurrections. Oh, it was perfect, it good? But... Okay, I'll, no, I'll accept that. I mean, I've, I've heard very few reviews of it either way. Man, I don't, I had never heard of any of these it's, movies. It's, it's a fun movie because it's like, it's literally the, the Wachowskis commenting. It, it, the movie itself is a commentary on like, how dumb is it that we have to make a fourth movie in our franchise? Because if we don't, the studio will do it without us. So let's make a movie that's about how stupid it is that you have to make movies that you don't really want to make because otherwise the studio will do it without you. <laughs> wild. Yeah. It's wild that so, somebody after, after the matrix trilogy, I have, I have a lot of good things to say about the matrix series of movies as a whole, but watching those movies individually one at a time felt like they were running out of ideas fairly quickly. So <laughs> it's, wild, it's wild that, that the studio would be like, yeah, we should make another one of these. Well, while you look through movies that are upcoming, I will chime in with my paleo pal, which this episode is a review via Apple podcast from RJM five, four, four, which sounds like, Sounds like a spy code name. It's you know, like there's that whole like three five five spy thing in Why the Last Man, and there's that other movie about, but it's like Lady Spies. It's like three five five. So like five four four feels like a different kind of spy, maybe a different kind of spy we never even heard before. Anyway, they say this is an excellent science podcast that keeps things accessible but still informative on a wide array of intriguing subjects and beer reviews. If you're looking for neat science and cool hosts and guests, this is the pod for you. Five stars. Well, thank you, RJM544. Those are the kind of reviews that help people find the show. And even if you're not, you know, a person who typically leaves reviews, reviews are a way that really helps get the show in front of the eyeballs of people who are looking for shows to download and enjoy. So reviews are a very free and easy way to help us get the show out there a little more. So we encourage them when when the mood strikes you to, to, to write them. Are all the movies anybody's making anymore? Just oh, you know what? The Dungeons and Dragons movie sounds like a wild time. I am looking yeah. forward to that. It doesn't look that bad. Yeah, and all, <laughs> this is just going on like what I've heard about the premise. I don't think I've even watched the trailer. Oh my god! It's crazy to me that like there's all this footage coming out of Venice Film Festival with Chris Pine being you know begrudgingly involved in the don't worry darling press tour and he's got like this kind of below ear length hair and i'm like it's wild that that's not the hair he has in dungeons and dragons he's got like short just typical chris pine hair in that yes we have to come up with a thesis my friend okay now this thesis is for rjm so rj is the first two letters in the name m for the first initial of the last letter of their name 
And RJ has written in previously and identified himself as a submariner and tinkerer. And when they wrote in originally, they wanted to know what the best science was. So that's the context I have and our conversation with Ryan North. So I think we have to come up with some sort of nautical, potentially subaquatic, submariner, but villainous thesis for RJ, right? Right, but... Because they got to be a villain. Are, we're not trying to answer the question what the best science is? We already answered that. We answered that in episode... Which episode was it? Episode 312. What did we, we say? That. What's the answer? I didn't I didn't include it in the show notes, and I didn't listen through to the entire episode again to, to find out. But that episode also happened to be about the supposed cryptid marine monster called Chessy, which is the sea monster of the Chesapeake Bay. So maybe does RJ study is does he use his submariner evil powers to capture cryptids and train them for war? Hmm. I also feel like if we come if we want to come up with a fake acronym, maybe Nemo, Captain of the Nautilus. Hmm. Nemo, Northern Emergent Monstrous Occurrences. Northern Emergent Monstrous Occurrences. Well, I was trying to get north in there for our buddy Ryan. Yeah, yeah, no, I thought, I think that's, uh, yeah, yeah. How about, how about applications of Nemo? <laughs> Northern Emergent Monstrous okay. Occurrences. And the use, <laughs> and their use in acquiring funding <laughs> for PhD researchers. No, it's going to be their use in acquiring power to conquer nations. <laughs> Wait, so say that again. Yeah. Applications of Nemo and their use in acquiring power. To Federal topple. funding through coercive grant writing procedures. Essentially, what you do is you hold Washington hostage until they increase your PhD funding with the Nemos. It's by the ocean, right? Washington, D.C. It's like it's like on a river close to the ocean. It's on the, it's on the coastal plain. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't have to, like, shamble through some mountains or anything like that. You don't have to, like, cross a big forest. Maybe go up a river a little bit, and then, like, and then you're there in the city, blowing hot salt water, superheated salt water vapor on uh, politicians and their families and pentagons and the like, right? <laughs> yes, the, the the Pentagon is not in D.C. It's over in Crystal City, or Pentagon City, technically. But... There's a place called Pentagon City? Yeah, well, it's a stop on Metro. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's not a stop I utilize often. All right, how's this? Applications of Nemo, Northern Emergent Monstrous Occurrences, and their use in acquiring federal funding to topple city-states case study of training a chessy to commit villainy on behalf of doctoral research call it co you put the word coercive in there coercive doctoral research and then implying that you're using a monster somehow to make it possible yeah okay so applications of nemo northern emergent monstrous occurrences and their use in acquiring federal funding to topple city states a case study of training a chessy to commit villainy on behalf of coercive doctoral research mm. we should pluralize chessies Training chessies. So, no, how about chess I? Just to make you think stupider, as if it's like a, a Latin thing. Okay, if we're going to make it that stupid, we have to include <laughs> a scientific binomial name after it. Okay. What's its, what's its species, Ryan? I think it's Chesapeake's Monstorius. Okay. Right? Yeah, so what's its family? The family is probably, I mean, at the family level, we're probably inclusive of all lake monsters. Yeah. But usually you wouldn't include, you wouldn't include family in a thing like this. Oh, okay. Like, to, a lot of times, okay, I guess, yeah, for, for those unaware, in paleontological or biological research, if you're referring to a species in the title of a paper, it is not uncommon to, in parentheses, put the scientific, you know, binomial name of that animal in the title of your paper but you wouldn't include the family unless your paper was about the entire family i see 
That's fascinating. It's also fascinating that they call them binomials. Well, just because it's the two names. No, no, I understand. It's just in mathematics. Mathematics as a field steals nomenclature from other like other things and just makes it something entirely like a binomial is something that's completely different. The other thing I see that people get wrong all the time on the internet is when you write a, you know, a a scientific name or the binomial nomenclature or the, the Linnaean classification or whatever, you know, those two words, the genus and the species, both words should be italicized. The genus is capitalized and the species name isn't. Okay. But they're always in italics, right? Unless you're writing it by hand, in which case you can't really write italics by hand. No, no, you do. You tilt the page sideways. If if you can write in italics, kudos to you. But when I'm handwriting, I will underline them to indicate that they ought to be italicized, but I can't write in italics. If you're doing it by hand, you should draw a little picture of it instead of of writing out its I mean, there might be a Loch Ness emoji we can include. (laughs) For now, here's what we got, Ben. Give me me a yay. Does the Library of Congress allow you to put an emoji in your thesis title? I I feel like that would break their search algorithms. All right. Final final review. Final review and, and opportunity for revision of RJ's thesis. Right. Applications of Nemo, Northern Emergent, Monstrous Occurrences, and their use in acquiring federal funding to topple city-states. A case study of training Chesai, Chesapeakus Monstorius, to commit villainy on behalf of coercive doctoral research. Cool. That's good. I'm really happy with that. That's I, that's one of the better ones we've come Yeah, with. yeah. It's really good. It's a Nemo. Nemo is what did it. It's, it's just such a tight algorithm. Acronym. Yeah, that's it. Acronym. <laughs> I'm not following a procedure based on the name. <laughs> this didn't just give me a hint to the anti-life equation oh no <laughs> once, once Ben unlocks the secrets of the anti-life equation we're all doomed that's just how it works Yeah. well that's the show Ben that's all good we got show. good show you got, you got anything you want the people to know about in your life in your world other than cute little puppy man who no not really I'm, I'm kind of keeping my head low these days but I might get back to okay. podcasting well, I've I've been feeling the hankering lately. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if the the situation in the world gets more or less stressful in the future. If it gets less stressful, I might be back in business. I don't know. There you go. Well, I know I know the people love to hear from you, Ben. So. Oh, I love the people. They're so squishy. Spoken like a thing that's definitely not an AI. <laughs> All right, Ben. Well, it was a delight getting a chance to catch up with you this evening. I really appreciate you taking the time yeah, for, this for me and the and the listeners and the viewers and the creeps. Thanks, creeps. There. Yeah, creeps is it. Um, I'm not going to explain the reference. If you listen to the same podcast I listen to, you know what I'm talking about. That's all I got to say. Okay. Thanks for listening. Come back next time for a whole lot more science. Sort, sort of. of. Audio production for Science Sort Of is done by Rob Heath at Rob Heath Studios. Thanks, Rob. Visit sciencesortof.com for show notes, links to all the stories we talked about, and ways to interact with the hosts, guests, and other listeners. Science Sort Of is brought to you by the Brachialobe Media Network of Podcasts. That's all for this week. See you next time on Science Sort Of. I'd love, speaking of fact-checking, I'd love hiring a fact-checker because there's this really sort of heady emotional stew where you want to put out a book that's correct and you want any errors to be caught as soon as possible, but you're also paying someone good money to show you what an idiot you are. <laughs> so like, it's, a, it's almost like a literary BDSM. You're like, yeah, me. like <laughs> you're paying them and you're saying like, I want you to find stuff, but I also want you to find nothing and I don't know how I feel and... Every email I get from you, my heart goes up. Oh my gosh, I can't imagine. It's intense. I recommend it to anyone who wants to feel alive is to pay someone to follow you around and correct you. It'll really change your life.